Heaven by Randy Elkhorn. Chapter 42. Will there be arts, entertainment, and sports? Music, dancing, storytelling, art, entertainment, drama, and books have played major roles in human culture. Will they remain a part of our lives on the new earth? I'm convinced the answer is yes. Will we sing and make music? Have you ever sat in stunned silence after listening to music beautifully performed? If you're like me, you don't want to leave that presence of you don't want to leave the presence of greatness. On the new earth will we never will. Our great God will be above all, beneath all, and in the center of all. We'll see his wonders not only in his natural creation, but also in every human achievement. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Psalms 104, verse 33. On earth, creative, artistic, and skilled people sing and play instruments to glorify God. The Apostle John speaks of trumpets and harps in the presence of heaven. Revelation chapter 8, verses 7 to 13. Revelation chapter 15, verse 2. If we'll have musical instruments in our pre-resurrected state, how much more should we expect to find them on the new earth? The Bible is full of examples of people praising God with singing and musical instruments. In the temple, a representation of God's presence, 288 people sang and played a variety of instruments, 1 Corinthians chapter 25, verses 1 through 8. The psalmist instructed the people to praise God with trumpets, harps, lyres, tambourines, strings, flutes, and cymbals, Psalms 150. Ezekiel says, we will sing with string instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of God. Isaiah chapter 38 verse 20. Jesus sang with his disciples. Mark 14 verse 26. And the apostle Paul instructed Christians to sing to the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19. James says those who have reason to be thankful should continuously sing praises to the Lord. James chapter 5, verse 13. The 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth sang a new song before God's throne. Revelation chapter 14, verses 2 to 3. People in paradise sing a song of Moses, a song written on the cursed earth. Likely the song of Exodus 15, rejoicing in the redemption of Passover. Revelation chapter 15, verses 2 through 3. This suggests we'll sing both old and new songs, songs written on earth and songs written in heaven. The songs emphasize God's greatness, justice, truth, holiness, and uniqueness. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. Scripture sings, Scripture songs will endure. But other music from earth may also be preserved. Consider Handel's Messiah. Luther's A Mighty Fortress is Our God. The Black Spiritual Swing Low Sweet Chariot. And Isaac Watts, Alas, and Did, and did My Savior Bleed. What about the thousands of great hymns and praise songs for hundreds of cultures? Imagine a remote tribe singing praises in a beautiful language we've never heard. Although some lyrics will require theological correction, others will be suitable as is, ready to be sung in God's presence. Just as new songs will express old and new insights about God, the old songs will expressively will, the old songs will express earthly insights about the context of heaven will have a greater depth meaning. Will secular songs survive? Not if they dishonor Christ, but what about songs that cried for perspective and deliverance? We might recall and even sing such songs to remind us of when we longed for God and when we, He answered. 
maybe other old songs, less deep, but not sin corrupted, will be sung just for fun. Just which of your favorite songs will survive the fire? If there is a specific reason why some wouldn't, why listen to them now? Music is transient, a bridge between this world and the other. That's why people devote so much of themselves to it and gain such pleasure in it. We love the rich and varied rhythms and harmonies. In heaven, God will unleash our creativity, not confine it. As musical nov novice, I might compose something worthy of Bach. And what kind of music do you suppose Bach will compose? Well, we dance. Throughout the ages, people have danced to God's glory on earth. Ecclesiastics chapter 3 verse 4, Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 12 to 14. After the parting of the Red Sea, Miriam and the women of Israel danced and played the tambourines, singing praises to God. Exodus chapter 15 verses 20 to 21. King David leaped and danced and celebrated before the Lord. 2 Samuel chapter 6 verse 16. The psalmist says, you turned my wailing into dancing. Psalms chapter 30, verse 11. When the prodigal son returned, the house was filled with music and dancing. Luke chapter 15, verse 25. How much more should we expect to dance on the new earth? God plays his music and dancing alongside the simple earthly joys of planting and enjoying fruit. I will build you up again, and you will be rebuilt. O virgin Israel, again you will be taken up. Again you will take up your tambourines and go out to dance with the joyful. Again you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria, and farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 4 through 5. It's God, not Satan, who made us to dance. If you believe that Satan intended dancing, or that dancing is in Apparently simple. You give Satan too much credit and God too little. God placed within us an instinctive physical response to music. As music is a means of worship, so is dancing. True, some dancing dishonors God, but as some eating, drinking, praying, and religious activities dishonor God. Unfortunately, much dancing has become associated with immorality and immodesty. But, of course, that kind of dancing won't exist on the new earth. Well, we tell stories. God regularly reminds his people of his past acts of faithfulness. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. History, when reviewed, history when viewed accurately, teaches us about God and about ourselves. It's a record of our failure to rule the earth righteously, a record of God's sovereign and gracious redemption for us in our planet. The angels will be able to recount the creation of the original universe. Job chapter 38 verses 1 through 7. But we'll have an even greater story to tell. The creation of the new universe, Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. When we gather at meals another time, we'll tell stories of past battles. We'll recite God's acts of grace in our lives. Are we practicing this now? Some of those acts of grace we don't under we didn't understand at that time. Some are. Some we've resented, but we'll see then with an eternal perspective. Just as we just as we're now capable by person's story to just as we're now captivated by a person's story of heroism or rescue from a danger, we'll be enthralled thrilled by the stories we'll share in heaven. I want to hear John Elliot Ed McCrollin, Pete Fleming, Roger Yoderin, and Nate Saint discuss their final days on the old earth. 
I can't wait to hear John Newton's story and William Wilberforce's and Mary Magdalene's. Wouldn't you love to hear from the angel who strengthens Christ in Gethsemane? Luke chapter 22, verse 43. Imagine sitting around campfires on the new earth, wide-eyed and adventurous recounted, as the adventures are recounted. Yes, I mean telling real stories around real campfires. Why not? After all, friendship, laughter, stories, and cozy campfires are all good gifts from God. Consider the wonderful ending of John's Gospel. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the book that would be written. John chapter 21 verse 25 The Gospels contain wonderful stories, but they record only a small fraction of what Jesus did. And that was only during the brief span of his life on the old earth. How much more will there be to tell about his never-ending life with his people on the new earth? How we can look forward to endless adventures, encounters, profound sayings, and delightful experiences with Jesus. When he tells a story, we'll all be on the edge of our seats. On the new earth, our resurrected eyes and ears will see and hear God's glory as never before, and our resurrected hearts will be moved to see his beautiful to see his beauty everywhere. We will live in a land of fascinating observation, captive captivating insights, wondrous adventures, and spellbinding stories. The greatest novels, plays, and movies are stories of redemption. Think of less mis miserables or the Chronicles of Narnia or the Lord of the Rings trilogy. They draw their shape and power from the ultimate redemptive story, the greatest story ever told, and it will be told and retold for thousands from thousands of different viewpoints, emphasizing different details, will be permanently engraved in the hands and feet of Jesus. That story, above all, will be in our hearts and on our tongues. Will there be art, drama, and entertainment? God is an inventor and a director of an unfolding drama of redemption. He created the universe, then wrote, directed, and took the leading role in history's great story. He who, we who, have lived our own dramas and participated in God's, we whose lives were enriched through drama, should recognize its value in the new universe. The quality of drama will likely be vastly improved. Imagine how our imagine how new minds and bodies in the new earth will stir us up to worship, dialogue, and captivity. Will we use the arts, including drama, painting, sculpture, music, and much more, to praise God? Will they provide entertainment, enjoyment entertainment for resurrected people. C.S. Lewis says, When you painted on earth, it was because you caught a glimpse of heaven in the earthly landscape. Ultimately, the new earthly landscape will be heaven's landscape. But that won't eliminate art, which is a God-given gift to his image bearers. Art will rise to higher levels in the new universe. Will we see movies in heaven? Many current movies celebrate sin and therefore won't have a place there. But good movies, like good books, tell powerful stories. Movies on the new earth might depict sin, but the Bible does show it to be wrong. But for many, but for any trail of sin, there would be a greater emphasis on God's redemptive work. Professor Arthur Roberts writes of drama in the arts of in heaven. Some people may find it difficult to envision his drama or literature without plots involving villainy, deceit, 
violence or adultery. Such fears are understandable because it is difficult to see beyond the horizon of our experience. These questions reflect an inadequate vision of resurrected life. Do our adventures depend upon sin for flavor? I think not. In heaven as on earth, effective drama portrays a triumph of good over evil. I dare say the vastness and the openness of the renewed cosmos offers adventures adequate for epic tales, which just at as as just at it provides a raw material for the virtual arts for painting and scriptural and architecture. Rather than forget about our lives on the old earth, I think we'll depict them in drama and literature with perspective and gratitude to God. Will people really write new books on the new earth? Why not? Reading and writing aren't the result of sin. They're a result of God's making us his image bearers. Unless we believe that the present earth will be greater than the new earth, then surely the greatest books, dramas, and poetry are yet to be written. Authors will have new insights, information, and perspectives. I look forward to reading non-fictions. I look forward to reading non-fiction books that depict the character of God and the wonders of his universe. I'm eager to read new biographies and fiction that will tell powerful redemptive stories moving our hearts to worship God. We'll be resurrected people with minds, hands, and eyes. As we've seen, there will be books and buildings in heaven. Put enough books in a building and you have a library. Imagine great rolls of books, hundreds of thousands, millions of them. Imagine oak desks and ladders reaching to great shelves heavy with books. If you like the sound of that, you may spend a lot of time in such libraries or serve the king by helping others find the right books. Will you be one of those Will you be one who writes new books, perhaps? I want to be part of a group that explores that vast reaches. I want to be part of a group that explores in vast reaches the new cosmos. When my fellow explorers and I return home to Earth, the capital planet, and enter the gates of the capital city, we'll gather for food and drink and catch up on our stories. We'll listen to our your stories. Maybe we'll listen to you'll listen to mine. Perhaps I'll write about great planets and star systems far away. I'll tell how my explorations deepened my love for Jesus, and they'll you'll play or sing for me the music of praise he composed while I was gone. I'll marvel at his beauty, and I'll see Jesus in it and in you. Maybe I'll write a book about the Omega Galaxy while you write one about the music of the heart. We'll exchange manuscripts, stimulate our insights, and draw each other closer to God. Well, we laugh. If you're not allowed to laugh in heaven, I don't want to go there. I wasn't Mark Twain. It wasn't Mark Twain who said that. It was Martin Luther. Where did humor originate? Not with people, angels, or Satan. God created all good things, including good humor. If God didn't have a sense of humor, we as his image bearers didn't. That he has a sense of humor is evident in his creation. Consider adbarks and baboons. Take a good look at giraffes. You have to smile, don't you? When laughter is prompted by, and by what's appropriate, God always takes pleasure in it. I think Christ will laugh with us, and his wit and fun-loving nature will be our greatest source of endless laughter. There is nothing like the laughter of a dear friend. The Bible often portrays us around the dinner table in God's coming kingdom. What sounds do you hear when friends gather to eat and drink? The sound of laughter. My wife Nancy loves football. She opens our home to 
family and friends on Monday night football. If we come to, if you come to our house, you'll hear cheers and groans about the dominant sounds in the room. But the dominant sounds in the room, week after week, is laughter. God made us to laugh and to love to laugh. It's therapeutic. The new universe will ring with laughter. Am I just speculating about laughter? No, I can point to scriptures, passages worth memorizing. For example, Jesus says, Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Luke chapter 6, verse 21. You will laugh. When will we be satisfied? In heaven. When will we laugh? In heaven, can we, when will we be satisfied? In heaven. When will we laugh? In heaven. Can we be certain of that? Yes. Jesus tells us precisely when this promise will be fulfilled. Rejoice in the day and leap for joy. Because great is your reward in heaven. Luke chapter 6 verse 23. Just as Jesus promises satisfaction as a reward in heaven, he also promises laughter as a reward, anticipating the laughter to come. Jesus says we should leap for joy now. Can you imagine someone leaping with joy in utter silence without laughter? Take any group of rejoicing people, and what do you hear? Laughter. There may be hugging, back slapping, playful wrestling, singing, and storytelling. But there's always, but always there is laughter. It is God's gift to humanity, a gift that will be raised to new levels after our bodily resurrection. The reward of those who mourn now will be laughter later. Passages such as Luke 6 give the earth, give the early Christians strength to endure persecution in an understanding of heaven as the compensation for lost earthly privileges. In early Christian Greek tradition, Easter Monday was a day of joy and laughter, called Bright Monday. Only the followers of Christ can laugh in the face of persecution and face only the followers of Christ can laugh in the face of persecution and death because they know that their present trouble isn't all there is. They know that someday all will be right and joyful. By God's grace, we can laugh on earth now, even under death's shadow. Jesus doesn't say, if we weep, soon things on earth will be, will soon things on earth will take a better turn, and then we'll laugh. Things won't always take a better turn on earth. Sickness, loss, grief, and death will find us. Just as our reward will come in heaven, laughter itself, one of our rewards, will come in heaven, compensating for our present sorrow. God won't only wipe away all our tears. He'll find our hearts with joy. He'll fill our hearts with joy and our mouths with laughter. The fact that we could wonder whether there's the fact that we could wonder whether there's laughter in heaven shows how screwed our perspective is. C. S. Lewis says, But in this world everything is upside down. That which if it could be prolonged here would be a treachery would be truancy is like it is likeliest that which in a better country is the end of ends. Joy is the serious business of heaven.